All right, so today's our last lesson on energy. It's going over fusion and fission. And this equation is very, very important. It's the first time we're going to use it. E equals mc squared. I'm sure you've heard it before. If you've done chemistry, you probably used it in chemistry. Even if you haven't done chemistry, I'm pretty sure you've heard of this equation before. <laughs> it's probably the most famous equation there is. It stands for energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Now the speed of light is a constant. It is always, uh, we're going to use 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, and what this says is that energy and math can be converted into one another. I don't really like saying they can be converted into another. Um, it says they're the same thing. So in grade 10 science, you usually learn um, conservation of mass. And in grade 11 physics, which we did a week ago, we learned conservation of energy. The important thing is those two things are conserved together. Right? You can have um, energy becoming mass or mass becoming energy. Again, I don't like saying becoming. It's better if you think of um, mass as simply a condensed form of energy. If you get enough energy into a small enough space, you will create matter. Okay, so that's what that equation means, and we're going to use it. Why are we going to use it today? Because we're going to learn about fission and fusion reactions, because in both fission and fusion reactions, we end up with less mass. And so what happens then? Where did that mass go? Energy. Right, so we'll be calculating the energy released in these reactions. All right, so let's look at the difference here. Nuclear fission reaction. This is the one that is pretty much in use, right, everywhere in nuclear power plants. Inside nuclear power plants are fission reactions. Now, a fission reaction works by taking something extremely heavy, um, like uranium. So here I have an example reaction. So we have uranium-235, and we shoot a neutron at it. You shoot a neutron at it, the nucleus becomes too big, it breaks apart. Sort of like a water droplet as it's falling. Okay? If it gets too big, it just splits. So in this case, it's split into, well, my diagram's different from here. Here I have barium and um, krypton. But then you also get three other neutrons. Now here's where the danger occurs. If you have one uranium atom, that splits because you shoot one neutron at it. It then releases three neutrons. Each of those neutrons will hit another uranium atom, causing a reaction. And each of those reactions will release three neutrons each. So now we have nine. Those will all go and hit nine atoms, each creating three neutrons. So now we have 27. You can see how this can really quickly, exponentially get out of control. And so in any nuclear reactor, what they have is um, control rods. And these control rods simply absorb neutrons. Now you need the right amount because you don't want to stop the reaction. You don't want to absorb all the neutrons. You just don't want it getting out of control. Because right? if you get out of control, it produces way too much energy. Right? It could um, completely evaporate the coolant and then your fuel rods can start melting down and bad things happen. Now there are a lot of safety controls. Uh, for example, at the one, the huge nuclear reactor that we have in Ontario, um, there's a really cool safety control where there's a bunch of um, control rods hanging from the ceiling and they'll just absorb every single neutron if they fall into the pool. So all they have to do is fall into the pool. Now they're hanging using electromagnets. So they're hanging above the pools literally with electricity. So if the place loses power, if something happens, they automatically fall into the pool, absorb all the neutrons and stop the reaction. Right? So it's a really cool safety measure. Right? So most of the time, nothing to worry about. <laughs> but of course, yesterday we did learn about um, other places like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima. And 
to be honest, the future of nuclear power is not good. Not because it's not safe. It's extremely safe. There are certain accidents which are terrible, but it is extremely safe. And the reason why there's no future for nuclear power is the cost. All of the nuclear power plants that have been built are extremely expensive to build. Not too expensive to run, but extremely expensive to build. And all the ones that have been built previously are getting close to their expiry dates. And companies just don't want to build entire new nuclear power plants. So there are lots of other companies looking at, say, module nuclear reactors, like smaller ones, right? More compact that you can just deliver somewhere and turn it on and run a city. <laughs> um, they would also be safer like that. And then you also have research being done in nuclear fusion. Now, fusion is the opposite. Instead of taking a heavy atom and splitting it, we take light atoms and combine it. So I have examples of um, nuclear fusion over here. Right? You would take, say, um, hydrogen nuclei, so protons, and they would combine and you would form um, isotopes like deuterium and tritium and then until you finally get uh, helium. So you take hydrogen, combine them, you form helium. Now, overall, this reduces their energy level because hydrogens, if you have two hydrogens, they have this much energy, but when they become helium, they're at a lower energy state. So that energy gets released and it's looked at as the loss of mass. And we'll go over calculations to see what that looks like. Um, so this occurs typically, not typically, all the time in stars. So our sun has um, mostly hydrogen in it. And in its core, it's constantly fusing, fusing hydrogen to form helium. Eventually, when all the hydrogen in its core is um, used up, it'll start fusing helium into things like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. Our star is going to stop there. Right? Our star is not big enough to then start fusing those elements into heavier elements. And that, that'll be the end of our star's life. Now, when it starts to fuse helium, it's producing a lot more energy. And so, it, like a star exists based on an inwards um, pressure of gravity with an outwards pressure due to the nuclear fusion, shooting out all that energy. But when it fuses helium, that outwards pressure is going to increase. So our star is actually going to swell. It's going to become very, very large. It's going to come out to about the orbit of probably Earth, uh, which is not good news for us. <laughs> That'll be the end for Earth when it swells. Um, but it's also going to turn red because it has to distribute that energy over a much, much larger surface area. And so it's going to be less hot. So it's going to be a red giant. And that'll be the end of Earth. <laughs> which is why it's important that we leave Earth at some point. Uh, no need to worry. Still got about a billion years or so before that happens, though. But there are lots of research going now on the planet that is producing fusion reactions. So it's nothing new. We've created fusion reactions in many labs. Right? It, it's hard. It requires insane temperatures of millions of degrees and extremely strong magnetic fields to keep those... um plasmas due to those temperatures um, concealed or confined. Um, but the problem is the, why we're, the reason why we're not using it is because currently it's taking more energy to keep the reaction going than what we get out of the reaction. And so it's not really feasible to be used as any energy source. But we're getting closer and closer and closer to breaking that barrier. Once we've broke that barrier and we're, we're able to make more energy than we use to keep the reaction going, then it's going to be an incredible new source of energy. Because right? you don't need to find uranium to fuel it. It's just going to take hydrogen. Right? Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. It's everywhere. Right? It's in water. <laughs> right? And it's a lot safer. Right? Because it requires energy to keep it going. 
right? Whereas a fission reaction um, has to be controlled or else it'll get out of control. Right? If you lose energy, if you lose power in a nuclear fusion reaction, you don't have the energy to keep it going, so the reaction just shuts down on its own. So it would be a lot safer um, and potentially could give us a lot more energy than a fission reaction once we get the physics right and the engineering. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, the energy that is produced from these reactions. So a couple of new terms. One is binding energy. That's the energy used to hold a nucleus together. And the other is mass defect. I like to think of mass defect as simply uh, the lack of binding energy. But you can also think of it as the difference between a calculated mass of an atom, that should say of, of an atom, based on all the nucleons and electrons present, and the actual atomic mass. So this is how we're actually going to calculate it. So I'll get to that in a second. Um, but coming down here, this is a decay series. Okay. Um, you do not need to memorize decay series. It sort of builds on what we learned um, in our previous lesson of alpha and beta decay, right, where you would have, say, an alpha decay. So you'd have, here's your atomic mass number. And here's your atomic number. So this tells you what element it is. And you can see how the element uh, changes as you have alpha decay, beta decays, alpha decays, until it reaches a stable element. Uh, the most stable element would be iron. Right, so... Iron is sort of like the middle point. So you have nuclear fusion, combines lighter elements, fuse it together, decreasing in mass, therefore getting um, energy released until you get to iron. If you want to fuse iron, it requires energy. Going backwards, the same thing, right? If you have something heavier than iron, splitting it or fission gives you energy. But once you get the iron, if you want to split iron, it requires energy. So once you have iron, going either way requires energy. It doesn't give you anything. So that's like the stopping point right, as you come to iron. Right? And that's um, with a star as well. Like he much, much bigger, heavier stars, once they get to iron in their core, uh, that's it. And they have no more outwards pressure shooting outwards. All you have is an inwards collapse of gravity and that would be a supernova or the death of a star and supernova has so much energy involved into it that it's able to then give iron the energy it needs to fuse and creates all the other elements on the periodic table shooting out into space eventually uh, coming into our solar system during its formation and we form the earth and so if any of you have say like a gold ring you can look at that gold and say, a long time ago, that gold was formed during the death of a star. Right? That's where it came from. And that's, that's I kind of like that. It's pretty cool. Um, much better than, than diamonds, where we say diamonds is just carbon crushed. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's try some problems then here. Oh, I forgot to mention this here. So we talked about mass energy conservation. We also have charge conservation. So I kind of mentioned this. That's your atomic number. Your atomic number is the number of protons, but what we care about is that charge is conserved, which is why uh, yesterday when we had beta decay, the electron, even though the electron is not a proton, we wrote negative one because we care about conserving charge. Right? Protons don't need to be conserved on their own, but nucleons need to be conserved. So the number of protons and neutrons, that's our top number. And we're going to use this idea to solve the next couple problems. Actually, let's um, come back to question one. Let's solve question two first. All right, so question two. We have two examples. First one is a fission reaction where we're going to split up a heavy element. And the next one is a fusion reaction where we're going to combine lighter elements. And what you have to do is just um, conserve charge and conserve nucleon number. So the top is your nucleon number. So on the left side, we have 236 and 1. So that's a total, sorry, 235 and 1. So that's a total of 236. That must equal the same on the right side. So we have 146 plus some unknown one. It's called X plus 
1, but we have 3 of them, so plus 3. So you can solve for x, okay, and you would get 87. All right, so you also need to conserve charge. So on the bottom, we have 92 and 0, which is 92. That must equal 57. Let's do 57 plus, let's just call it y, and then plus 0. All right, so if you solve for y, um, you get 35. And then you can look on a periodic table and go, oh, 35 is bromine. Right. We do the same thing with fusion, although it's easier because we have such uh, smaller numbers. Right. So we have 2 and 3 give you 5. We have 1 over here, so we're left with 4. 1 and 1 give you 2. 0 here, so we're left with 2. And periodic table says your second element is helium. All right, so the first example... Here it says, determine the mass defect and binding energy. Essentially, we're trying to find the same thing, because remember, um, mass defect is the lack of binding energy. So once we find the mass defect, we can use E equals MC squared, and we'll have that binding energy. Of a lithium-7 nucleus, given that its actual atomic mass is 7.01600 atomic mass units. So lithium-7 looks like this. It has seven nucleons and three protons. So four of those are um, neutrons. All right, so together the entire atom has an atomic mass of 7.01600 atomic mass units. But if we're to add up the mass of all of its parts, meaning um, trying to find the total mass of three protons plus four neutrons and three electrons, we wouldn't get the same thing. And we can test this out. So let's try this. So a proton mass is 1.007276 atomic mass units. A neutron is 1.008665 atomic mass units. And an electron, which we must also consider because it's part of the atom, <laughs> is 0 0.000. .000 five, four, nine atomic mass units. When we put that on your calculators, we're going to get 7.058135 atomic mass units. So this is more than this. So what happens is when all of these come together, they occupy um, a lower energy state. And so we have um, a mass defect here. And we can calculate that mass defect by just finding the difference in these two masses. So 7.058135U, it's all the parts together, minus um, the mass of the atom itself, which is 7.01600U. When we do that, we get a mass defect of 0.04213. 5 u. So now that we know the mass defect, we can use E equals mc squared, where m is the mass defect, times the speed of light squared. However, we need to put in everything in SI units, so I need to change this 0 0.042135 atomic mass units into uh, kilograms. And so we have a conversion ratio where 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms is one atomic mass units. So multiplying by that number, and we will cancel out the atomic mass units. And then don't forget the speed of light squared. So 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. And we get an energy of 6.294969. And it's going to keep all the units for now. Times 10 to the minus 12 joules. Now in physics, we also have another unit because this is so small. We have another unit for energy called the electron volt, which I go over where that comes from in grade 12 physics. Uh, but for now, one electron volt is 
602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per electron volt. So if I divide by this ratio, I'll get 3.93 times 10 to the 7 electron volts or 39.3 mega electron volts. So in our last example, we have a fission reaction. So we have uranium adding a neutron, uh, splits into cesium and rubidium, uh, shooting off three other neutrons. And what we're going to do is I've given you the mass of the uranium, the cesium, the rubidium, and the neutrons. We're going to add them together, and we're going to find the left side does not equal the right side. In fact, the left side is going to be bigger, right? because this they moved into a lower state of energy. Remember, the lowest is um, iron. So that's why iron is so special. Okay, so let's try uh, right side. So the right side of our equation here. So we have cesium, 139.909, plus a rubidium, 92. 0.922 plus we have three neutrons which is 1.009 I forgot my units terrible terrible okay uh, left side I'm use a different color why because I can uh, <laughs> so left side we have uranium 235 0.044 plus uh, one neutron. And what we get on the left side is 236.053. And on the right side, we get 235.858. Right, so we have a mass defect there. We can calculate what that mass defect is. So we'll write delta M equals 236, so we'll just find the difference, so subtract the 2, minus 235.858, and we get a mass defect of 0.195u. And we can figure out the energy, we're going to use E equals mc squared. I think I have one more color, well, black, I can use black. Um, so E equals m c squared. Now the mass is in atomic mass units, so again we want to change that into kilograms. So we'll multiply that by the conversion, 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 uh, kilograms per atomic mass unit, and then multiply all of that by the speed of light squared, so 3 0 0.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And I sometimes get students forgetting to square that, so don't forget to square that. And we get 2.9133 times 10 to the minus 11 joules. Or if you wanted to convert that, it's 182 mega electron volts.